Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. It, um, you are really in for a treat with this talk. And also, I love it in here because we're nice and cool. So thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, if you haven't visited Mukai recently, we really encourage you to come and stop by. It's such a beautiful property. Friends of Mukai steward the house, the Japanese strolling garden, and the fruit barreling plant. And we just had a donation of four really, really large, like this big, koi to our pond. And so um, it's really fun. So if you want to come, please come and join us there. And it's always such a great spot to come for a little bit of respite. Such a beautiful place. So thank you again for coming. And I want to introduce Lori, who are, we are just really grateful that she took the time to come here tonight to share her story with us. She is a third generation Japanese American and a descendant of the Samurai Warrior. Lori Sugawa Whaley is an inspirational speaker on a mission to empower others to reach their God-given potential, no matter their path, heritage, or circumstance. Whether she is inspiring prison inmates at the local correctional facility, college students at Pierce College, or business executives at the Project Management Institute, Lori captivates attention and compels listeners to live inspired, purposeful lives of powerful contribution that extend far beyond the day-to-day -day realities of commerce. Having grown up in a predominantly Caucasian farming community, Lori struggled with being different. She channeled her unrest into tireless research and curiosity to study and embrace her Japanese heritage. Today, Lori models the way of the samurai warrior every, with every story she tells and every move she makes. Happily married and the proud parent of two adult sons, Lori's empty nest has opened doors to limitless opportunities for her to fly as she shares her passion, message, and gifts as an encourager of possibility to inspire and delight diverse audience, audiences in her Puget Sound backyard and beyond. Lori graduated with honors from Portland State University with a bachelor of art, bachelor degree in art. She is a member of the Japanese American Citizen League, Japanese American Society of Washington, Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington, and Toastmasters International. Please, please give a warm welcome to Lori Sugawa Whaley. Good evening. I'm so thrilled to be here and thank you all for coming. It means a lot to me. And I just would like to share about my passion and my past and about the Samurai Warrior. So hello, I'm Konnichiwa. I'm Lori Sagao Whaley. I'm a third generation Japanese American and I'm proud of my Japanese heritage. However, it saved my life, but it didn't always begin that way. Now this picture is very special because it's pretty old. <laughs> I'm a senior citizen, but a family friend brought that, took our family portrait to Japan and he had the four of them made into plates by some, some person or some business in Japan and brought them over. So there are four of us who have the one place and the oldest and the youngest were out of that range to get their picture on the plates. But it came with matches. And I still have the, the thing. I think it's really sweet. Um, when I was in grade school, I was teased and bullied. And I didn't realize I was Japanese and different. In fact, somebody called me names and racial prejudice. But I decided not to let that defeat me. Because I had grand, a grandmother who would share with me about Japanese culture. And she tried to teach me Japanese. I remember her food and just being very fond of the smell and the, her, her place, and I just, I loved it. Whereas my other brothers and sisters, you know, they were, they're very American, but up here and in my heart, I'm very Japanese. So I went through school, high achiever, cheerleader, and on to college. And when I went to college, I decided I wanted to learn what my parents were saying behind my back because I didn't understand what they're saying except for Okane and Takai, maybe that's it. But I wanted to learn what they were saying. So I took two years of Japanese when I was in college and started the journey of learning more about my Japanese heritage. And while after I uh, finished college, 
I work for the Tacoma Art Museum, and the, the curator told me that I was much more Japanese than I realized. She goes, I think you ought to go to Japan. And so I did. Back in the early 80s, my husband and I traveled to Japan, and I just felt so much at home. I was amongst people that had black hair and looked like me. They didn't talk like me, but I just loved it. So we decided to go to Japan and spent most of our time in Kyoto. And while I was there, we went to the Jidai Matsuri. We've only been back there once since that time, back in the 80s. And there were, uh, there were over 2,000 people dressed in period attire. And one of them was Tomoe Gozen. She is the famous female samurai warrior that you probably see in anime and manga. But she lived, look at the date she lived, 1157 to 1247. Now that's a long life for somebody back then, even now it is. So I, she really left an impression on me because I didn't realize there were female samurai warriors. And the, our family uh, had, my father has family in Shikoku. And so we went there and then they gave us a copy of our family crest. And I didn't think too much of it at the time. I, I saw, I, I, and our family tree, and I said, oh, thank, domo arigato gozaimasu, thank you so much, and they treated us like royalty. It was really wonderful. But then life goes on, getting married, children, and then in 2005, in 2007, I was rear-ended rear twice, and that, I was left with traumatic brain injury, chronic pain, I couldn't think straight, and I had a decision to make. What was I gonna do? Was I gonna stay in that condition? or was I gonna move on trying to do my best? So I decided at that time, my husband was almost ready to retire. And I thought, he can't take care of me for the rest of his life. So I worked hard and I went to over a thousand appointments to get better. Physical therapy, physiatrist, um, you name it. I, vis yeah, vision therapy and then therapy for the brain, cognitive rehabilitation over a thousand appointments because I didn't I didn't give up my mom and dad told me you don't give up you try everything you can but don't give up so that's what I did and I worked tirelessly I thought well you know I'm here I am in this condition I can't do a whole lot so I started researching and decided to write a book and found out through the research that our family was part of the samurai lineage and many families can share the same crest. But this one has uh, three stylized swords and three leaves that look like hearts. And it is one of the samurai crests of feudal Japan. And so I continued to write tirelessly, whether I wrote 20 minutes or two hours, I was determined, never give up, to write that book. So when the book took, was published in 2015, I was so excited. And then again, it, it was, we, I signed a contract for a new edition of the book. And when that came out in 2020, I was so excited again, because then I knew that that DNA of the samurai warrior, it was in me. So the new book, new edition is called, Let the Samurai Be Your Guide. And Tuttle has an interesting, Mary wanted me to mention that Tuttle was developed or started in be to be a cultural bridge between Japan and uh, the United States around the wartime. And now it's many countries, many Asian countries, and they specialize in language, culture, cooking, history from between the two countries, and it's, it's a wonderful organization. So I found out that the Code of Bushido is what the samurai live their lives by. And I do have a, a, a PDF that you can have at the door, at the door when you leave, before you leave, be sure to take one of those. Uh, but they live by that code of ethics, and that's what made the samurai great. Because yes, they were great warriors, and they practiced kendo and all the martial arts, that was the left side, but the right side, they did the poetry, they did haiku, painting, they, they were artists, and also they did the tea ceremony, so they're very well-rounded individuals. And I believe that's one reason why the samurai are so great. In fact, I have a great quote. Uh, it's in the book. It's called, it says, let's see. Among the pantheon of warriors, the samurai is surely the greatest. Tetsuro Shigematsu. 
And I think that's, I personally, you know, because I am Japanese, I think the samurai were really great and they're still great. And like Tomoe Gozen is still talked about today. And that's over a thousand years ago. So you want to think about your legacy. What is your leg? What are people going to say about you a thousand years from now? About you and and your work, or or your family, or something like that. And I mentioned about the Kotobushido guide, and I have those in the back. And if you can come after the talk, you can come there, and I'll give you one. And you could also purchase books at that time too. We just had to start pretty much on time. And those seven codes, they pledged their lives and their sacred honor to defend the code. It's courage, integrity, benevolence, respect, honesty, honor, and loyalty. And I say seven words, seven codes, seven words, like do the right thing all the time. And that's pretty much what the samurai were about. In theory, <laughs> they didn't all, maybe not always did that, but do the right thing all the time. Now, when you think of the samurai warrior, what comes to mind? Or Tom Cruise. <laughs> that movie was, of course, Hollywood, but it did bring the samurai more to the forefront and more to people's awareness but they really were amazing warriors. And I believe that even during World War II, the Japanese, the Japanese that came from the camps that they went to fight, they, are, they were modern day samurai warriors. And I'll repeat it again. Among the pantheon of warriors, surely the samurai is the greatest. That's te Tetsuro Shigematsu. And the first principle I'm going to cover is Yuki, and Yuki is courage. And I have a short clip that's going to be played by Jesse. So if you'd like, oh, thank you. Thank you. 
for courage, I chose to speak about Tomoiko Zen because her life is, is really inspiring. If you think, I, I met, I'm sure she didn't think that a thousand years from when she passed away that her, she'd be in movies, not movies, but an anime and manga. She probably didn't even, they didn't even have anything like that then. But now she is still being talked about. So I wanted to include her. She's an inspiring woman. They say that she could take hundreds of men at one time and come out alive. But she wasn't given much credit back then because she was a woman and it would have been shameful for her to be highlighted because she's a woman and she did so well. This is a painting of her. They say she was very beautiful with fair skin and long black hair. And this is the modern Tomoe goes in. <laughs> Our next one is about honor. And honor is such an important principle in the Japanese culture. Because what is left when your name, your name is everything. And if you lose your name, what do you have? And even though he was in the book, under courage, I thought, I want to, Tomoe goes in, and so Tioni Sugihara is my example for honor. But actually, he's an example for each one of the codes, and his life really inspired me in first writing this book because I saw him, his legacy, and his exhibit at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle back in the 1990s, I believe. And he had everything to lose and nothing to gain as the vice council from Japan to Lithuania as the war in the 1940s. They lived a lot, he lived a wonderful life and when he was in high school, he was a great student. His father wanted him to be a doctor but he did not like the sight of blood. So how can you be a doctor if you don't like blood? <laughs> so he goes down to Korea to take the medical exam, and the only thing he did was write his name. That means I was here, but I didn't take the test. And so his father was furious and announced to him that my obligation to you has now ended. So he used to do college, fun college on his own. He wanted to travel the world, and he loved languages and wanted to teach English and other languages, but now he has the chance because he's funding his own college. And he went through college and took many tests and looked, turn, I'm sorry, he took many tests and then he also became a diplomat, but he spoke so many languages, he was a perfect person to be a diplomat. And when he was in Countess Lithuania, he found out the, about the plight of the Jewish refugees from Poland. And they would come during that summer in 1940, they came to him for, ref, for transit visas. That means that they could get a visa from Lithuania to other parts of the world, but they needed to get out because they knew that their future would be annihilation. And so every day, hundreds of people would come to the, the consulate's doorstep and they, they, he didn't know what to do with it because all the other consulates said no. But he had a chance, and he asked, his, no, he asked his children and his wife, what would you do? And they said, Papa, you've always taught us to put ourselves in their shoes. And so he did, and decided to write the visas, meaning that could be his life, it could be imprisonment, it could be losing his job, and he did lose his job, and he was in prison. But he said it's more important to save lives. There's nothing wrong with saving people's lives. And so that was quite a decision that he made. He, he would not take money for it, but he did help maybe 10% of the Jewish people at the most. But the ones that he did do, that they were able to get a visa, but families could leave on a visa, and one yeshiva in its entirety with over 300 students were able to leave. So they call them the Sugihara visas. And today there are over 100,000 survivors from, from his visas. And my husband and I went to, um, well, actually, he was not born there. He was born near Gifu, but the museum was not at the actual birthplace where he left. But we saw visas, and we saw the 
impact of one person. So some of you might think, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? And I don't know that he thought that, but he, his main objective was to save lives. And sometimes we may not feel that we're important, but you do what, whatever you're called to do, do it to your best. And that's what he did. And that ripple effect has saved thousands of lives. And I've heard of people who said, oh, yes, my, I have Jewish friends. And they said, oh, yes, my so-and-so lived and uh, survived the visas. And so they called them Sur Sugihara survivors. And the museum was very sobering. And he did not receive uh, any money, except the government of is Israel wanted to know what they could do. And he said, please take care of my son, who was probably, I think, about a teenager at that time. So they, the government of Israel educated his son in college. And then he actually married a woman. And they live in Belgium. Yes. Oh, actually, I wanted to say. I don't know. In the book, I have what it has for um, what it has for the. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, in the book, there is a the actual replica or the picture of the award that he got from Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. So next, we have honor. We have Saigo Takamori, and he's called the last samurai. Oh, correction. I did include Sugihara and Tomoe Gozen under courage. So Saigo Takamori is honor. And he was quite a man. He stood six foot tall, over 200 pounds. And in the 1800s, that was quite a large man. And he was a force to be reckoned with. He, he came from a lower class samurai family in southern Japan on the island of Kyushu. And he's also called the last samurai. But he's a man of principles. He didn't waver. If he saw, thought something or he saw th something that was wrong, he would bring it to the attention of those in authority. And they didn't always like it, but he's a man of principle and would not back down. And that's the way he lived his life. Here's a statue of him in Ueno Park with his dog. And this is also a, a Yukio, the woodblock print of him. And the author, or the, the artist, is unknown. Another person I want to talk about is the Matsumoto, well, actually, Roy Matsumoto. And this family was divided during the war. Like you remember, during the Civil War, one would be on one side and the other. Well, the same thing happened in America. Part of the, his brothers were in Japan. And he and his brother, other brother, were in the United States. So they were recruited by the US Army to be in the MIS, Military Intelligence School, because they spoke, they spoke fluent Japanese. And this picture is taken right in front of their, the family studio, two blocks from the epicenter in Hiroshima. So all during the war, he thought his family was gone. And he didn't know, and there's no way of communicating back in the 40s. You couldn't communicate, and especially with an enemy. But when he went to Japan and he was interrogating the prisoners of war, he met his cousin. And his cousin said, your family is safe. And he was so relieved. And then he, further, he does further investigations and in interrogation of the pr Japanese prisoners, and he sees his brothers. And so he was relieved, and he's, because he was you know, part of what the Americans were doing, he took a little extra time to talk to his brothers, of course. But can you imagine doing the war, during the war, and they were taken out of those camps, we call them camps, but they were really, they were incarceration camps, really. But they didn't, they weren't there, they served in the US, for the, in the US for the MIS on the Pacific side, Pacific Theater. And the reason they found out that he was even in the war or a war hero was when his daughter, Karen Matsumoto, was in college. And her, the professor says, do you know this man? And Karen says, that's my dad. And so they, she didn't know. It. She was probably in her 30s. And she didn't know that her father was a hero. And he was part of the Merrill's Marauders. 
is when they went in with, uh, eight, I believe, about 800 soldiers, and they came back with about a quarter of them. So it was very dangerous. And he would, he was so, so versed, and he understands so many dialects in Japanese because he worked in L.A. serving the j different Japanese families, and they all spoke different dialects. And so he understood Japanese, you know, up and down and all different types of di dialects. So he would climb the poles, and he would intercept enemy messages. And because the Japanese did not speak in code, he was able to tell, come back, tell his commander, this is what they're going to do. This is what they plan to do. And because of his, his and other efforts that the MIS soldiers did, the American war, Americans knew so much more about their enemies. And they say that these, the war efforts probably saved over a million lives and maybe two years in war. I think that's really quite impressive. And they were sworn to secrecy for 50 years. So most of the information we have about them, some of it is gone to the graves with those that have passed. One of them was my uncle. He was in the Philippines. But he couldn't tell us much because he passed away before that 50 years was up. And they even made a um, movie about him. And this is him, a sweet little man. <laughs> He's so cute. He went to uh, Washington, D.C. to receive his gold medal. This is what the gold medal looks like. And Makoto honesty. And honesty is another trait or principle of the Japanese that's really gone down through generations. And they don't... I don't know that they really teach the principles in this way, but they teach honesty. In fact, one of the first things that a young child does is they find a coin and they take it right to the police station. And that is their first interaction. And they say that the police do not have a lot to do because people in Japan don't, co don't commit a lot of crimes. And the example I chose for that was the Moriguchi family. And how many of you have been to Wajimaya? <laughs> Pardon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we love Wajimaya, yes. And it's Uwajima uh, from the island of Shikoku. And Ya yeah, is the store. So it's a store of the goods from Uwajima. And the father came over and taught, would sell fish cakes and other goods to the Japanese fishermen and the Japanese farmers and loggers. But then the World War II came, and they moved from Tacoma to Seattle. And then Seattle had the World's Fair, and that catapulted their business. And they realized that they can branch out just, not just Japanese, but Asian food. So now they're considered the Asian specialists in the Northwest. This is a story. Uh, picture of them. You have Tomo and his wife. And then in the back, you can see... Denise, who is now the CEO of Uwajima. Uwajima, yeah, sorry. And Gambaru, is samurai determination. And I, although this is not a principle of the samurai, what I did was included it because I wanted my mother to be in my book. <laughs> and Gambaru, we all know about Gambaru, never give up. Try your hardest, do your best. They say that before a test or a game because they always encourage each other to do their best. And even during the earthquake and tsunami of 2011, um, that's what they did. They went around and they, they'd say gambate and they would help each other. They didn't have the stealing and looting that they would in other cultures. They say in the first six months, over $70 million came back to the rightful owners. And there was even one story of a man who left money in a public restroom. And he said, I have no use for this money. I want to, this to go to the victims of, the, of the, the devastation. And if you've been to Japan, you know that it's a very honest country. And I would go shopping, especially like at the flea market. And if I lose my package or forget about it and go down a few stalls down, it's right back where it, sh it was. And you don't have, feel like you have to look over your shoulder all the time. It's a very safe country, and it's my happy place. 
How many of you remember May 1980? Some of you may be too young. <laughs> well, I happened to be driving at that time, but it was quite devastating. People say that the ashes went on forever for weeks, and I know that it, I don't know if you have heard the statistics, but it's, I'll just briefly mention them. They are quite devastating. 150,000 acres devastated, 57 lives lost, 250 homes destroyed, 47 bridges in need of repair, 15 miles of railway, railways destroyed, 185 miles of high rates ruined, millions of trees strewn like matchsticks, 7,000 big game animals as well as thousands of birds and dead fish. And so at that time, my, parents, my father is a farmer, but the, he also invested in real estate. And they came across this dilapidated, defunct nursery and right along the highway on I-5. And so they bought it. And my father says, well, what are, you gonna, what are we going to do with this? We've got to find somebody that will run it. And my mom says, well, I'm going to run it. And my dad says, you don't know anything about running a business. She goes, I don't care. I'm going to do it. So she tirelessly worked every day scouring nurseries around the southwest Washington in the Portland area, finding the best plants for her nursery. And she, the opening day or the opening week, she thought all she had to go and down, down to the nursery and just look pretty, and people will buy her, of course, buy all of her nursery stock. But one day, the only thing that sold was one lonely geranium. And she was so de devastated. She cried, and she goes, oh, I just want to quit. I, wanted, I don't want anything to do with it. And she goes, nope, I have to. I have to. Samurai honor. I cannot quit. I, told my, I taught my children not to quit, and so I have to, I have to continue. And sh that she did. She worked hard. In the first year, she only took maybe a few year days off. And then after that, she started adding staff to it. But... Every year, she would do something to improve the nursery, whether, whether it was do the new building, they bought the house next door, turned the swimming pool into a koi pond, and they had so many, so many customers that they were blocking the street, so they bought the property across the street, and they, that's their parking lot now. So I'm so proud of my mom because she told, taught me not to quit, never quit. There's always a way, and in your life, there's always a way. If you have a goal, say you want to lose weight. There are people out there that will co coach you and help you to lose weight, or you want to help, help in business. There are people out there that will help you with that. So it's almost like the yin and the yang, no matter what. Or you may have a service that someone else needs. So always think that you can be the solution, or you could seek a solution. This was taken quite a few years ago, in 1981, when they were still alive, and that's my brother up and me in the back. This was, wow, quite a few years ago, <laughs> and my mother and father. Yeah, the, the, it was so dilapidated. And, it, and she, when she first started, she had a, a really bad truck. And literally three times on the freeway, it broke down. And a family, it just, my mom was just, things just worked out for her. I don't, she always won things or every, she just never worried and she always felt like things were going to work out. Well, after the third time that this truck broke down, a family friend told dad, she goes, George, you have to buy Mabel a new truck. And so he did. And they have customers up and down the I-5, you know, as far as Bellingham and maybe as far as Salem or Eugene. And because Mokai Farms is part of this event, I wanted to, I don't know if all of you know about Mokai Farms, but I find it fascinating. The, we were just there right before we came here, and the home was, uh, they wanted to combine two cultures. So the home is very Western. It's a, a beautiful little house. You can go visit there, and they'll have events there. But the wife wanted to keep the Japanese culture, so she was quite a, quite an, a landscape person and designed a garden for their home. And you can see in the back, the, oops, <laughs> I don't want to talk that loud, the cold press. And that was quite innovative too because most, like my father, just 
they picked the berries and they shipped them off to the cannery. Well, they went a step further and they processed them and they put them in barrels. And then they began processing them for other farmers. They were really innovative, I thought. And here's their strawberry field. And believe it or not, I'm a farmer's daughter. I remember doing that. And I thought, when I used to pick berries, especially in the rain, I thought, this is not my life. Now, do I look like a farmer's daughter? I know how to work. I, I did learn how to work, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I want to encourage all of you that um, no matter what you do, there's always a way and to never give up. And that's called gambaru or gambate. Do you, are any of you familiar with that word, gambate? No? <laughs> so now you are. Gambate is the Japanese spirit, never give up. They, they work tirelessly. And if you see, if you know anything about what they did during World War II and how they had to weather those horrible times in those camps, my, both my parents were there. My dad was in uh, Minidoka and my mom was at Tule Lake until they separated them and then she became domestic help and my dad stayed there until his mother had cancer so they found respite for them in Idaho, actually Boise, Idaho. Isn't that interesting? So I think uh, if you want to take away is anything is about gambate and about the samurai and how we can use those codes principles for our own life. Because if you ask anybody, a friend or maybe some, especially maybe younger kids, do you have a code of ethics that you live by? And if they don't, you can always encourage them to think about the samurai. Think about one of the codes. And I have a lot of bookmarks back there that you can have. And you can, you're welcome to take as many as you want. And just as a good reminder that the code of Bushido is alive today and it's alive in the Japanese people and it's alive in whether I think there are modern day samurai warriors now. And I'm going to be, my next book is about Gambaru. And I'll tell you one story. I, I'll see, we have a little bit of time. One story is that I met a man about a year ago who was a speaker at a, um, a Clemmer camp I went to. And when he was very young, he found out that he was going to be blind. And that was going to be the rest of his life. He would be, not be able to see. So rather than just rolling over and say, well, that's que sera, sera, he took that challenge. And he, re he before he was blind, he never read a book all the way through. And then after, he says, I read a book every day by listening. And he's written about, I don't know, I think about 40 books. And some of them have been made into movies. And to me, and now he's also a philanthropist. He's given away millions of dollars. This is just one man in his determination because he didn't want to let that define him. He got married, and he has an assistant that helps him, of course, with a lot of things that he cannot do because he doesn't have sight. But I thought his life was so inspiring that I want to include his story in my book. Have you ever heard of The Ultimate Gift with James, James Garner? Maybe not. Well, anyway, he, that was one movie that I found out that he actually did, and I saw it, and it's a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful story. So anyway, I want you to think about your own life and how, I, I don't want this just to be a lecture, because my intent is for you to actually start embracing the Code of Bushido. And gambaru or gambate is one way you can do it, is just never give up. Just put your stake in the ground and say, I'm not giving up no matter what. You know, I don't care. There's got to be a way, just like me with my traumatic brain injury, I wasn't going to give up because I didn't want to be reading at the seventh grade level for the rest of my life, plus have my husband take care of me. <laughs> that wouldn't be a fun way for him to spend retirements. And plus, we had grand grandchildren were on the way, and I just thought, no, I'm too, it's too, I'm too young to not to enjoy life. So I am enjoying life. And, be, and be, had I given up, I wouldn't be here with you today, nor would I have written this book. So I just want to encourage you that no matter what it is in your life, don't give up. You know, you are important, and what you do is so important. You might think, ah, it's just this. But no, if, it's like we're all pieces of the puzzle. 
And if there's a piece missing, it, and if you do like those big pictures, and you have one little piece missing, it just kind of spoils the whole puzzle. And I don't know if any of you do puzzles, but my sister does. And if she's missing one, or my mom, they, my mom and my sister used to play it. And my mom would take a couple pieces out of there. And it would just drive my sister nuts. <laughs> because she couldn't finish it. And so then my mom said, oh, I found it. And then she put the pieces in. I, see, I did it. <laughs> but so, so many lessons from my Japanese parents and my Japanese relatives and grandparents and how you never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. So the word is gambate, and I'd like us all to say that. And you can say it like you mean, like, gambate, or you can say it like you really mean it. And so I'd like to, on the count of three, we could all say gambate, gambate, if you don't mind. You can say it like one, you could do it like three. Gambate. Let's say it a little bit louder. Gambate. Now say it like you mean it. Gambate. So I just want to encourage you, thank you for being here, and just remember the courage of the samurai, and do the right thing all the time. And I'm, I'm literally trying to recruit some modern samurai, samurai warriors, because I believe that the world is looking for leaders, and we can step up into our leadership role, even no matter what it is. Maybe it could be with your family, maybe it could be in the community, maybe it's within your job or organization or business. So I thank you so much for being a wonderful crowd. And that now we can have time, a little bit of time for questions and answers. Am I on? any questions or remarks or want to see anything or any more information about some of the things that Lori talked about? I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you um, change your life to get over your problems with your brain injury. Sure. Gambate. <laughs> I did not want to give up. I didn't want my husband to take care of me, and I felt, I was in my 50s then, and I felt I have too much life to live. It just didn't make sense for me to give up. And I w sought out health professionals that would help me, because there was one ophthalmologist that told me there's no correlation between my head injury and reading at a seventh grade level. And I say, okay, thank you. So I just seek out, there are good, people out there. They're good professionals, good therapists. And I just kept searching until I could find a good one. And one of the most helpful ones was a speech pathologist. And I thought at that time, well, I could speak okay. Sometimes I'd lose words, but it wasn't anything major. But it was more the cognitive rehabilitation and the audio processing. I heard things, but upstairs they didn't make the connection. So that's what I did. I just kept searching and Asking around, I was part of a traumatic brain injury support group. Uh, I do Elevate every day. That's an app you can get on your for your iPad. And I know it's for the Android too. But it helps you keep your mind sharp. And because our everything, our mus brain is a muscle. And as, imagine never walking for 10 years. What would you do? You atrophy, right? And so that's the same with our brain. So I want to encourage you to do those things that will help. Puzzles, Sudoku, um, Elevate, learn new languages, be with people, don't, ju don't just sit in front of the television, be active, learn new things, exercise, and especially things that you cross your arms and your legs, like dancing and ping pong, that's really helpful. Oh, and I just want to mention, I am going to have a drawing, and I'll pass this around if you want to, there's a, if you don't have a, if you don't have a business card, you can just use one of these. You can pass some of those around. Put your name and your email, please. I'd love to include you on my email because I t I, it's just informational, great information about Japan, great information about Japanese in America. And also, I'm a shameless plug, I'm going to be taking a group, small group of people to Japan in October. 
Yeah, so if you could sign one of those, and I'll have a, we'll have a little small gift for you in the back. Are there any other questions? Yes. Did you have a question? Okay. Hello. Uh, sorry to be late. I was having dinner with the people who bought Tokes Farm, or one of Tokes Farms. Oh, okay. And they were talking about strawberries, and I got to thinking, and then that made me late for this meeting, that there were several farmers of Japanese descent growing strawberries on Vashon Island, uh -huh. which is a brand new fact to me. I'm interested in the, and then the, also the Matsuda farm, um, I'm interested in the level of cooperation or competitiveness. Each of these families was in business. Each of these families had to survive, certainly before World War II. Uh, just curious about your understanding of how people got along here as Japanese farmers with the, with the life that uh, American citizen could be the only one to own and all that other stuff that they had to contend with. How did that work for the various families on Vashon Island, if you happen to know? Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't know how it happened. Maybe perhaps some of the people that are part of Vashon Island, but I know that my father was a farmer in Southwest Washington and had other Japanese farmers and they were really good friends. They helped each other. They loaned things. I remember my dad have, gave somebody like 500 of those carriers. He used to have them. And one of his friends wanted it. So he says, sure, just take them. And he still has them to this day, I think. But they helped each other. Like when there was a loan, they told each other about that. They were part of the, the farmer's organization. And that's just the spirit of Japanese. They're more of a team kind of mentality, more so than the individual. Is Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Twelve family farms, Japanese farms, on the island, and they all work together as a, as a cohesive group. Um, they brought their strawberries to the Mutai farm to be processed, so there's a, there's a good partnership in the many of them. Okay, as it happened, uh, Masa was my neighbor across oh, the street, uh -huh. so we got to spend time together, and he would talk about his life, but he didn't, as it happened, and he was in his 80s. He didn't talk about the other people that he knew on the island. So that's kind of why it was, it's a mystery box to me, even though mm. Moss was a very good neighbor and we had fun together. I was just curious about that part of it. Thank you. Have they done research about that or documented that? We're trying. You're trying. Okay. So okay. There, if you go to the Heritage Museum, they have, we now have a map that shows all of the Japanese farms on the island. We also have it at Mukai. And I know for our auction last year, Bruce Hallman did a tour of Vashon to all the Japanese farms. And one of the things we talked about is gathering soil from those farms and honoring them at Mukai so that we don't forget that history oh. on our island. So then the one thing that I heard that was contentious that I thought was interesting, if you don't know this, the Mukais were able to self-exile, which I didn't know that you could self-exile. I thought mm -hmm. everyone was sent to the concentration camps. But because the Mukais had family in Oregon, they self-exiled, and the rest of the families on Vashon did not. They were all sent to the camps. And I have heard that, that there was a bit of tension there, that when they came back, it was um, those that went to the camps and the Mukais that were able to leave. So we don't know much about that, but I think that's an interesting part of our history here. And that did happen with, uh, we had family friends that went to Eastern Oregon, and they wanted to, they did not want to go to those camps, so they had were able to go to a, be sponsored by a family or other families in Eastern Oregon, and they didn't have to go. Interesting part of history that we mm -hmm. often don't learn about. And that's a very sad part of our history, but in spite of that, the Japanese, like they always do, they rose up and they became a very successful group of people, and that's why most of the stories I have in my book are about the second generation Japanese Americans, because I believe they are the greatest generation, and what they endured, uh, it, it brings tears to your eyes, especially those that fought in the war. Well, they fought in the war while their family was behind the barbed wires. It's just, it's just it's t it brings tears to my eyes what happened, but they did it, and they, my father talks about it, but he's not bitter. He, he really isn't bitter. He just said, we just did what we had to do, and 
He lost his mother during that time because she had stage four cancer. Only a, maybe one doctor in Minidoka, so they had, she was taken and they had hospice for her. But he doesn't talk about it with any, any regrets or bitterness. He said, this is just what happened. We tried to do the best we can, but you know, it's, it's just amazing because I wonder, I wonder what I would do. Any more questions? Oh. Our gardens and the storage area and so forth. It's, it's a lovely little um, kind of like country retreat. Yes, it is. Bainbridge Island, which is not that far from here, is also an interesting place to, to visit. Okay. Do you want to um, just say, Stacy, where it is so everybody knows? Uh, so Mukai is, if you're in the center of town, on is that Beale Street? So you're in this Bank Street, thank you. It's not that I don't live, I do live here. So on Bank Street, if you head west, it's 107th and you take a left there. So if you took a right, you'd go down to Nashi Orchards. If you take a left, you go to Mukai. And um, yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. Come visit, it's open. We are the only private uh, park on the island that is open 365 days of the year to anyone to come visit whenever you want. And we do try and have the house open at least once a month for people to come see. And that has interpretive um, interpretive signs on the walls that tell you all about not just the Mukais, but the entire Japanese experience on Vashon Island up to World War II and beyond. Um, hello. I was just wondering what some of the things that happen from the code, some of the things in the code that affect your like daily life and some things that, you know, can help you through some of the, you know, more difficult times. Did you say COVID? No, the, the code. Oh, the, the code. code. I'm sorry. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. Didn't quite um, what are a few aspects or things within the code that you think that help you with either like affirmations or things that just help you get through like daily life? Daily life. Just planted your stake in the ground and remember the stories and look for good look for the good in people look for you know perhaps you could do something about gratitude and maybe find people that show courage or do something that positive that will help you increase your courage or your honesty because everyday life is it's not easy now but this is a wonderful place to gather and to be around positive people and people that want to make a change or want to improve their lives, because you can go down that negative road and talk about the bad weather or the government, and there's so much that you can do that's negative, or the people that are committing crimes, but they're the minority. Most, I believe that most Americans are decent people that want good for their families, and you just stay, stay in that lane. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Stay with the people that uplift you. Stay with the people. Read. Don't read the negative, dark things that are going on, you know, the murders. and That happens. I happened to work in the prison for 12 years. I did that after uh, I had my accident. And I would he gather their stories. And what, what I would do is I would bring, talk to them about what they can do. If, if they complained about prison, I say, well, what good can you do? You're here, you have a roof over your head, everything's taken care of, food, you can exercise, you can earn a little money, you can improve yourself. And so I had a book club in the, at the prison. And just start reading and thinking, and instead of going down that dark road, there's all kinds of horrible things that are going on, and you can read about and being reported, but that's not the majority. I don't believe that's the majority of the people. I mean, look at this crowd here. They're all wonderful people that want to learn and grow and be a contribution to our society. And I believe that's what most, that's, maybe I'm being Pollyanna or something. I don't know. But I believe that most people want to live decent lives and contribute and help other people. And you can sign up for my newsletter. <laughs> Always positive. No, no yellow highlights or red underlines. 
it's always something positive about what's going on about Japanese culture and what people can learn. And I go, we're going through the code. We'll keep doing that. It takes about a year to go through the whole code of Bushido. And I have stories and just wonderful testimonies. And I, that's what I do. Because I love, more than anything, I love to encourage people. And if somebody's down there, I want to bring them up a little higher. And if they're up there, I want to bring them up even higher. Not so that they get big heads, but so that they can realize their potential. Because people only, like Einstein, Einstein said, people only use a small part of their brain. There's so much more that we can use. Did that help? Or OK, good. <laughs> Well, I started as a teen, well, I was in, um, in high school, I was a te uh, cheerleader. Yes, that was only done about four year five years ago, maybe, when I was, no, maybe it's a little bit older. I did it for my first book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost, not quite that high, but I'm, I'm working on getting it back to where it was. But I can kick pretty high. That was one thing I've always been able to do when I was, I was limber. I was not a coordinated athlete. I hated throwing the ball or football or anything like that. But I like dancing and I like gymnastics. And that my only C I got in college was in judo. <laughs> I was so mad. <laughs> I said, "Well, I came. I had a good attitude. I don't care. You weren't very good." I said, "Okay." Well, if we're good with that, uh, Marie's going to be out in the lobby with her book. So um, Stan okay. has one thing I think he wants yes, to say. Yes, and then before that, before we go, Stan. I just wanted to give these flowers to Lori and thank oh. her so much. Oh, oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. <laughs> I also wanted to thank everybody for supporting this series. This is the last of our Tops on the Rock. I also wanted to thank Lynn and BCA because uh, it's a great partnership. Um, and I also wanted to welcome myself. I'm the new uh, board president for MUKAI. And uh, hope you guys come out and talk to us. We have a couple events, one in August. There's the Ghibli um, Totoro, August 15th. And then we also have our Japan Fest, September 9th. So please come out and support us. Um, we'd love to see you. So I just want to clarify what he was saying. It's, it's the last of the MUKAI partnership series, but we do have a couple more talks on the rock. We oh, do. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Just just to be clear, so because I think there was some like, wait a minute, because we have another one. The and actually, it was a rescheduling. That's. I want to make sure. John, did you but, get a picture of this? But it's uh, it's with. Uh, oh, <laughs> Lori's making sure her husband takes a picture here, so we're <laughs> we're gonna pause for that. But yeah, I'll make sure everybody signs uh, if you want to get in the drawing. Yes, I have this here. Did everybody get? Did I pick up all of them? I'll pick up. A, I'll get them more, Lori, while you guys get pictures. And then I think that's it. We'll start falling out. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'll be out in the lobby in just a moment. <laughs>